Lord, we've turned our backs on you far too many times. The cost of sin is too much to bear, but still you pay the fine. So I just don't wanna be another person in the crowd. Hear my prayer, Lord, hear my battle cry. And I'm so thankful for this intercession with you. I feel like I've entered into heaven when I'm in your presence. When I'm in your presence. And Lord, please bless this body of your saints with your family. I pray for love and abundant peace for all my enemies And I know that Satan's in there somewhere sitting in the crowd So hear my prayer, Lord, hear my battle cry And I'm so thankful for this intercession with you I feel I've entered into heaven when I'm when I'm your in your presence. Everybody sing along. Come on, it's a new day, and we're glad about it. It's a new way, but we're still grounded. Switched up a few things, but not far from a fashion. Cause we'll never change the fact our goal is to be saved So walking by faith consumed by your amazing grace It's a renaissance Good morning, Renaissance Live. We are so thankful that yet another day we've been blessed to see as God has blessed us once again to be in this place called the Renaissance Church of Christ. We thank you so much for all of our viewers. We thank you for the Renaissance family as we continue to pray uh, that uh, soon and very soon, as the song goes, that we'll be able to come back in corporate worship. And we are getting closer, and you'll, you'll be getting information about that. But again, we would just want to say thank you for all of the support we've had over the past year as we dealt with this pandemic, and yet we've been able to broadcast live every Sunday for over a year. We want to say thank you for the great support. Let us pray. Kind merciful Father in heaven, we're just so thankful that we've been blessed to have this opportunity to come today to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Father, for the message that will be brought. We pray for the, your manservant, Dr. Orpheus J. Hayward. Crown us here with wisdom and knowledge in part those things you would have us to know this morning things that we might take in, that might make us better servants for in the future than we've been in times past. We just pray for this congregation. We pray for churches of Christ everywhere. We pray that we continue to be on the battlefield to save lost souls. Continue to be with us, continue to bless us and keep us. This we do ask in the mighty name of Jesus, the one who was willing to die, that we might live. Amen. God has smiled on me. Don't you know that uh, he, he has set me, me free? Oh, 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 and God, God, God has, don't you know he has smiled on me? Oh, oh, oh and uh, he's been uh, good, so good to me. Oh, don't you know that God, God has, don't you know he smiled on me? Whoa, and uh, he has set uh, me free. Whoa, oh, 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 and God, God has. Whoa, he's smiled on me. Don't you know that uh, he's been good, so good to me? Whoa, oh, 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 and God has. Whoa, he smiled on me. Well, and he has 
set me free. Oh, God, has mount on me. Oh, and he's been good to me. It was amazing grace. Oh, how sweet. The sound of well that saved a wretch like me. And oh, I once was lost to know that now I'm found. Oh, well, was blind, but now, oh, now I see. Oh, oh, oh and God, God has. Oh, he smiled on me, oh, well, and he has set me free, oh, 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 and God, God has, oh, he smiled on me, oh, and he's been good, oh, and he's been good. I know that uh, he's been uh, good. Don't you know that uh, he's been uh, good? So good to me. morning, brothers and sisters. This is the communion where we commemorate the power of the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke 23 verses 46 tells us, and when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said to the Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And at that moment, he gave up the ghost. And at that moment, those standing around the cross, that moment appeared to be a moment of defeat, but it was actually a moment of victory. The victory that our Lord and Savior brought where he removed the wrath of God and where he brought us peace. And because of that, we have peace in our conscience because of his mercy. We have peace in our heart because of his love. We have peace in our mind because of his truth. And we have peace in our soul because of his presence. So at this time, 
Please bow with me as we go before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we approach you at this time, and we thank you, Father, for this bread, and we thank you for this cup, which represents your body. And Father, we thank you for this moment, but we'll never be able to thank you enough for what you did for us on the cross, because that moment that appeared to be defeat was actually a moment of victory. And we thank you for that present peace that we have today. And we pray, Father, that as we partake of this communion, that we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad glad you died for me. me. I'm so glad glad you shed your blood for me. sisters, this is the offering where we have an opportunity to give back a portion of how our Lord and Savior has blessed us. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it tells us that those that sow sparingly will reap sparingly, and that those that sow bountifully will also reap bountifully. It also tells us that when we give, that we should give as we have purpose in our hearts, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. But more importantly, in verse 8, which is important, it starts off by saying that God is able. And I think that that's something that we need to be mindful of as Christians, that if we do our small part, God is able. God has been able to make us, help us to make it through this pandemic. Soon we'll be back together and worship the service, in worship service together, having an opportunity to sing hymns and praises in his name. But at this moment, we have our opportunity to give a small portion of how our Lord and Savior has blessed us. So do your part because God is able. And as you look at the screen, you have the opportunity to do so by text message or by going online and giving your offering. So give as our Father has prospered you at this time. If anybody has a reason to sing, we do, Lord, we do. If anybody has a reason to sing, we do. 
Lord, we do. If anybody has a reason to sing, we do. Oh, we do. If anybody has a reason to sing, we do. Lord, we do. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. If anybody has a reason to pray, we do, Lord, we do. If anybody has a reason to pray, we do, Lord, we do. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. If anybody has a reason to shout, we do, Lord, we do. If anybody has a reason to shout, we do, Lord, we do. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. If anybody has a message to bring, we do, Lord, we do. If anybody has a message to bring, we do, oh, we do. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. If anybody has a reason to sing, a reason to pray, a reason to shout. Let us give thanks for the offering. Father God in heaven, we just thank you so much for once again just showing how amazing and wonderful you are to us. We thank you for the numerous reasons that we have to be happy, reasons that we have to know that you are in our lives. And we thank you for this opportunity that you gave us a reason to give and the opportunity as well. We thank you, Father, for blessing us in the way that you have. We thank you for sustaining your church during these difficult times and allowing us to be a part of your sacred ministry. And we just pray as always, Father, that as we have collected these funds during this time, that our eyes will be keenly aware of how you intend to use us and use these funds to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. And good morning to everybody, to all of our visitors, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are so glad that you've joined us once again. And quite frankly, y'all, I have to piggyback off that last song. Because as I reflected upon it, and as I looked to my left and looked to my right, this auditorium looks the exact same as it did over a year ago. I believe this is sermon number 53 or 54 since the pandemic. And if you look and allow your eyes to influence you in the wrong way, you will not find a reason to sing, a reason to pray, a reason to shout, or a message to bring. But I will tell you, despite the fact that we've been in this situation an entire year and more, we still have reasons to sing, reasons to shout, much to pray for, and a message to bring to everybody. And the message I want you to get this morning in the midst of us being in this same situation for over a year is that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So in as much as your situation from your eyes may not change, let it be the reminder that God doesn't change. And for that reason alone, we ought to sing, we ought to pray, we ought to shout, we ought to send the message. Speaking of the message... It is time once again for Brother Orpheus J. Hayward to deliver what God has given to his mind, his heart, and his soul into your living rooms, your kitchens, your dining rooms, or wherever you are. 
get yourselves prepared for the powerful word of God to be delivered right now after one more song. Please join us in singing because you have a reason to. Amen. and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, he is wonderful. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory, honor power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord. Mighty, yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. All praises be to the King of Kings and the Lord our God, He is wonderful. All praises be to the nation. In the name of Jesus, he is wonderful. Hallelujah! Salvation and the honor and power to the Lord. Yeah, yeah, what a mighty God we serve! Praise the mighty name of Jesus. He is, he is wonderful. wonderful. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. We're just grateful to God this morning for the opportunity to praise our Lord and Savior and to praise he who has created us. For we recognize that our salvation is rooted in the finished work of Christ Jesus. And for that, we are eternally grateful. I have learned that each and every time that God wakes us up on this side of life, it is another opportunity to get it right with him. I have long said that many people have asked for a second chance, but I'm just glad God gives another chance and that he is a God of grace and that he is a God of mercy. And we recognize that we can come to the throne of grace boldly and ask for help in our time of need. And for that, we are, in fact, eternally grateful. I do want to remind those of you who may have been following the announcements that we do, in fact, uh, want volunteers for the audio-visual ministry. And we want you to be mindful um, that we need individuals who are willing to learn, maybe some who already have a particular expertise, that you would lend your giftedness, that you will learn, lend your talent, lend your mind, um, to this ministry we call audiovisual, as we get ready to make our way back into the assembly, we're going to need personnel that can cover two services and can work this equipment with efficiency. So please uh, be mindful that we want you to contact us and let us know that you are interested 
uh, in being a part of the audio visual ministry. If that uh, is your desire and you wish to help the kingdom of God and you feel any level uh, of um, uh, positive pressure uh, to be a part of the audiovisual ministry, if there is any love of God in you, if you love Jesus, if the Lord has saved you from your sin, and if you have been forgiven, uh, if you are appreciative of your redemption, I'm trying to make you feel bad right now. Um, so I want you to do, uh, give your time and your talent to uh, this ministry and let us know that you are available for this work. I want to invite your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to begin my reading in verse number 12. And then I'll culminate that reading somewhere around verse 16. I want to uh, take a moment to elucidate and to expand a theological thought that I think is going to further our study of authentic Christianity. And as you know, I've been on this now for several weeks and I've been doing my best to travel down the road of the New Testament books to formulate for you a New Testament theology, a frame of thinking about doctrine that governs our behavior. And that is where we have transitioned into studying the book of Romans. And now we've landed into 1 Corinthians. So I want you to do the best you can to uh, follow along with us. We have been doing our best to uh, teach you that there is a such thing as authentic Christianity, and we have articulated that when we use the word authentic, we mean that which is corresponding to the original. And we wanna be sure that as we do Christianity, we wanna do it as it was revealed by the apostles so that it will in fact be an authentic experience. Uh, furthermore, we've moved through the book of Acts to give an initial framework of what authentic Christianity looks like, and now we've transitioned into looking at the New Testament books, and we want to do a survey of Christian theology so that you can see how certain doctrinal tenets govern the behavior of the New Testament church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 12, the Bible says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in human, excuse me, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thought with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he, who is spiritual, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of God or the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I want to live for a subject under the banner of authentic Christianity, the journey from the natural to the spiritual. The journey from the natural to the spiritual. I want to uh, do the best I can to explain this context and give you an exegetical insight into the meaning of the text before we hop into an application of the passage. I have taught people for a long time, those who are familiar with hermeneutical process, that it's dangerous to apply a text that you can't interpret. You have to first interpret the text before you can apply the text because you will often be led into a faulty application if it's built on bad interpretation. So I want to make sure that we're clear about the context that we're studying in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to place on your mind some thoughts that I think are quite important. Um, I want to just give a few uh, poignant statements that's going to frame the direction of this sermonic presentation. And I want to begin with some provocative questions, if you will. Uh, if you would look at the screen now on my second slide here, what if I told you the gospel is not um, only the way of salvation, but also a way of thinking? I want you to consider this with me. And those of you who are watching uh, via live stream, I want you to think about what I just asked you. What if I told you the gospel is not only a way of thinking, 
excuse me, a way of salvation, but that it is also a way of thinking. That the euangelion, the good news of the gospel, does not only save me, but it becomes the very paradigm that shapes how I think. Consider this. Can you detect when something you are hearing is not gospel wisdom, but a human perspective that has no divine credibility? Now, I want you to see how my first question um, really is inviting you into the notion and the concept that when we consider the gospel, this euangelion, this good news, that it is not only a salvific paradigm that saves me from my sin, but it is additionally a way of thinking in which the way I think and the way I process is filtered by a gospel paradigm, which means whatever information I receive, whatever you say to me, whatever I say to you, whatever your family paradigms are, whomever are your close friends or your close circle, whatever it is that's coming into contact with my mind, do I filter information through the wisdom of the gospel? So I want you to consider that as I move into authentic Christianity, that authentic Christianity is practice within the framework of a different kind of thinking. That is, the child of God sees the gospel not only as his or her salvation, but they look at the gospel as a paradigm or model of thinking through which all information for the Christian is filtered through gospel. Now, uh, I've, I've already preached um, uh, because if, if you let those two questions alone sit on your conscience, you're going to have to do some reevaluating just like I do, just like I've done. Um, because you need to start to think about in what ways do I use gospel and in what ways was the first century church expected to use the gospel. I want you to think about this. You will find that human wisdom rejects Christ-centered wisdom because it does not fit the natural paradigm. And I'll explain natural in just a moment. It begs the question, are you natural or are you spiritual? Now, those two terms we're going to find within the context of Paul's writing, and we're going to define those terms once we get to that part of the text. But I want you to consider that there is a such thing as a natural man, and there is a such thing as a spiritual man. Now, when I'm using the word natural, sukikos is the Greek term, I'm speaking about a word that described human life, but became philosophically associated and used to describe that which is in line with human existence, to be natural, to be natural. The natural man, I will show you, is someone who is committed Listen to human reasoning, natural. Spiritual is someone that is pneumatikos. Pneumatikos is a word in this context that's going to describe a person who is committed to divine spiritual thinking in which a person is guided by the wisdom of God and they suspend their loyalty to human wisdom. Now, all of us are going to have to ask some real serious questions. How much of what's in my mind is human reasoning? And how have I been inviting to the wisdom of God as a governing paradigm to what I think and thereby manifested in my behavioral modus operandi? I want you to consider this. Uh, as we go through this sermonic presentation. Let me quickly do this. Let me interpret this text. Let me tell you what's going on in the text, and then I'd like to start thinking about some applications um, as we deal with the passage. But before I even do that, before I do that, 
Um, I want you to consider this as we're about to talk about the wisdom of God and how there is a contrast between the natural and the spiritual man. Every one of us have to make a journey from the natural to the spiritual. What do you mean natural? I mean a person who is committed, loyal, and governed by human reasoning. Uh, in contrast, spiritual, someone who is committed and governed by divine reasoning. That's natural, spiritual. All of us have to start thinking along the lines is, uh, lines of what um, am I dominantly controlled by? Human reasoning or divine reasoning? Now consider this. I want you to consider how difficult that is. Do you know how much impacts your brain or your mind in the context and fabric of your existence on a daily basis? Have you considered from the inception of your birth to your right now present existence have you considered how many influences have shaped who you are? In other words, who I am today is the sum total of the experiences that I've had in my past to which each of these experiences have informed my thinking. And now God, watch this, invites you into the kingdom and now challenges you to unlearn what you think you know so that you can now accept a divine paradigm in how you think and how you behave and how you act and then use the divine paradigm as a filter for every bit of information you come in contact with. That's where you're talking about the spiritual and the natural. Do you know how much impacts your brain? Consider this. There are a variety of influences that you and I battle on a daily basis that impacts how we think about every aspect and fabric of life. And now God is inviting himself into your life and wants you to challenge these various influences that are antithetical to his wisdom. Consider this. I want you to look at um, uh, my, my, my slide up here. Uh, I have a picture of a brain, but I want you to really look at the influential aspects of what we go through in our lives. I am influenced in my thinking by the culture in which I exist. When I use the word culture, don't jump to sinful yet. But culture is a context in which my personality and my way of thinking is shaped. We are the products many times of the culture in which we were raised. And so many of my influences are culturally related. How I dress, how I speak, how I walk, how I talk is often the result of the culture that has conditioned me to behave in a certain way. My culture is often my reality. It is the world that I know. It is the world that I understand. This is why many of the language, uh, many of the uh, linguistic features we use or rhetorical statements we use are culturally sensitized, how we talk. The culture's music influences how I think. You'd be surprised how some people's dominant education comes from the music they listen to. We li whatever's in our car, what's in our car, what we, what we listen to while we're driving, you'll be surprised how the culture of the music in which you existed has shaped how you think. Music is a powerful influence. When we speak about the R&B or the hip hop culture or the, or the, or the rock and roll culture, whatever you want to speak about in the genre of music, all of those things influence how I think. I can remember growing up, there were so many rap songs that I could quote verbatim or songs that I listened to that I was able to quote verbatim. And you would be surprised how the, what you can quote becomes ingrained in how you think. And so you would be surprised about how musical genre is a form of education. How much are you, how much are you influenced in your understanding of relationship, your understanding of interhuman relationship, your understanding of life, your understanding of finance, your understanding 
about how you deal with another person, how much of that is influenced by what you hear in musical genre? You'd be surprised um, about the influence of that kind of culture. Another major influence that we all have to see as a reality is social media. Social media is a dominant uh, venue and conduit that impacts the very way, watch this, social media will mess around and impact how you think about yourself. Your level of self-esteem, lack of self-esteem, your level of confidence, your lack of confidence, your consistent comparison to what you see in social media or the images of what is in the, uh, what is in the context of what is desired is often shaped by social media prompts. It is so interesting that now they have it, I forget the official word for it, but they have it where um, social media can track what it is, what websites you go to for shopping. And by the time you get back to Facebook, there are ads that pop up that are predicated on what you look at. So they know how to entice you into a, into a, a world culture or a way of thinking by looking at what it is you're looking at and then they can prompt you into a certain buy or a spending of your capital into a certain kind of look or whatever it is that you're looking at and you will find that they know how to appeal to what it is that you desire. Social media. Social media, you'll be surprised how another influence is the news. The news is an entire venue that we need to be mindful of. And in the news, how many things we see, news often controls the narrative of what you consider reality. This is why when you listen to the news, you got to be careful because so much of what it is that we do, uh, or excuse me, so much of what it is we hear or so much of what we see is conditioned. How you view a riot, how you view what's going on uh, with Black Lives Matter, how you view what's going on in regards to criminal activity, how you view a certain race, how you view a certain ethnic group. It's all often conditioned by the narratives painted by news venues. You need to be very mindful that there is often a strategy that's designed to impact how you think or how you see something. This is why so many different people have different views about COVID-19 and about the vaccine because any commercial you see or whoever's controlling the news outlet will often have a narrative that they often want you to buy into and people have different views because of the different narratives. You'll be surprised how we are controlled by what we see. We are controlled by what we hear. Social media, culture, news outlets. You would be amazed at how many people learn life by with uh, how many people are learning how to do life through sitcoms stuff you watch on tv that's not even real and you judge your realities based on tv shows that you watch and they formulate how you view life they formulate how you view all it is that you're experiencing you'd be amazed at how people are impact in their thought passes thought process your family background is an influence how you view family dynamics is often conditioned by how you experience family. It is an influence. How you have how you view a marriage or a relationship is often predicated on what you have experienced in your upbringing. You, your mind is filled with information that has conditioned how you think and how you behave, and then God says, welcome to the kingdom, and God says, now there's some things I'm going to challenge that has influenced the very fabric of how you think. Do you not realize that how you think and behave has been influenced by this world in which the devil is the God of this world and has brought us into practices and behaviors that are antithetical to God? I've come today to tell you the gospel has to become not only your salvation, but it's got to become your way of thinking. And so... I want to invite you into that study and, and kind of really make our way um, into challenging how we see the influences in our lives 
and then determine whether I am the natural man or whether I am the spiritual man. And ultimately, how do we make that journey from the natural to the spiritual? The book of 1 Corinthians, uh, if there was a book that I think would make an excellent uh, controversial uh, movie that is full of mess and chaos, it would be 1 Corinthians. This congregation was, uh, was, was absolutely impacted by a divisive spirit and carnal thinking. When I think of the historical background of this text, I think the two words that dominantly describe the experience of the Corinthian church would be divisiveness and carnality. For we know that historically the word Corinth or the city of Corinth became synonymous with immorality. And we find that the New Testament church was located in this very immoral city. The issue is that the church situated in this immoral city that was known for its promiscuousness and its carnal thinking and its philosophical influence, the church, rather than influencing its community in which it existed, the church was being impacted by Corinth. It is a dangerous day when the church is less of an impact on its community and the community is more of an impact on the church. We need to be careful that the culture does not dictate to the church, but the church is an influence within culture. Be careful that the church does not start looking like Corinth, but we want Corinth to look like the New Testament church. And so it is that when you're reading the Corinthian document, it becomes interesting that it's issue after issue after issue after issue. Chapter 1, they are divided over preachers. Chapter 2, they are divided over worldly wisdom. Chapter 3, they are carnal minded. Chapter 4, they do not know how to view ministers as servants. Chapter 5, we have a young man that is, uh, that is sleeping with his father's wife. In chapter 6, we have Christians that are going to court over trivial matters. Chapter 7, they are dealing with the present distress and trying to understand how to deal with the very marital relationships. Chapter 8, they are divided in regards to the eating of meats unto idols. Chapter 9, they're trying to figure out whether or not Paul should be compensated or he should not be compensated. Chapter 10, they're trying to show that Israel was an example of bad behavior and Paul warns them not to be like the Israel of the Old Testament. Chapter 11, they are divided over the role of the woman in the New Testament church. And chapter 11 as well, they're divided when they come together and treating the Lord Lord's Supper like it's just a common meal. Chapter 12, they are divided over spiritual gifts. They're putting emphasis on tongues and prophecy and making these antithetical one to the other, putting the gifts in a sense of competition rather than being compliments that bring forth the absolute revelation of God. In chapter 14, Paul has to regulate the spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, they are divided over the resurrection because the Epicurean doctrine is now impacting the New Testament church and now they're dying doubting whether or not there is a resurrection. In chapter 16, he has to remind them to be benevolent to the church in Jerusalem that is undergoing a famine. Issue after issue after issue after issue after issue. I've come today to tell you the church needed to have a moment where they could learn something about the wisdom of God. And so when you're reading the Corinthian letter, issue here, issue there, divided over this, divided over that, carnal in their thinking. They are immature in their processing. And Paul is now having to regulate and stabilize the church from the malignancy of their behavior. So Paul starts in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. He says, I beg you, by the authority or name of Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in one mind and one judgment. And then Paul goes on to say, because I'm hearing of some of you, some say I am of Apollos, some say I am of Paul, some say I am of Cephas, some say I am of Christ. And then Paul asks the rhetorical question, is Christ divided? He says, were you baptized into my name? Was Paul crucified for you? Paul is starting to address the divisiveness that's happening in the Corinthian church. But then Paul makes a transition and he starts to speak about the church's influence over worldly wisdom. 
And now the church is starting to not only doubt the resurrection, chapter 15, but they are impacted by worldly thinking to the degree that the Corinthians are starting to embrace a philosophical posture that the gospel is foolish. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us it is the power of God. Those who are foolish, the word foolish suggests senseless. When, when these Corinthians who were being influenced by Athenian philosophy, Athens was about 30 miles from Corinth, many of the major philosophical thought processes came out of Athens. And so it is that Athens is now influencing Corinth and Corinth is starting to embrace the idea that the gospel is absolutely foolishness. And Paul says, listen, the preaching of the cross or the word of the cross, better translated, is to them that perish, it's foolishness, it's senseless. In other words, it was difficult for a person in Corinth influenced by Athens to accept the idea that a crucified person could also be savior. That's foolish. You mean to tell me the savior of the world and he who is sovereign submitted to crucifixion and you want us to believe in a crucified savior? That does not make sense to our philosophical understanding. For that notion of crucifixion, a savior submitting to that kind of death, seems to be within the fabric of weakness. Your gospel does not make sense. It's foolish. The foolishness of the notion that somehow, some way, that God came in the flesh, and you mean to tell me God in the flesh now submits to the notion of being crucified by the very people he created? You want us to believe in a crucified Savior? Are you suggesting that this fits anything that's intellectual? They would say, foolish. So Paul said, the preaching of the word of the cross is to them that perish is foolish. But unto us... It is the power of God. Now, by the time you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 into chapter 2, Paul begins to make a contrastive analysis between human wisdom and God's wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, please turn there. I'll paraphrase much of it for you. Paul says, when I came to you, or when I first preached the gospel, I did not come to you with superiority of speech. In men's wisdom, as a matter of fact, I would admit to you that my speech was not in line or maybe not up to the par or standard of the philosophical giants that you believe in. And not only that, some of you Corinthians have already indicated that my speech seems deplorable in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Some of you have already said my letters are weighty, but I am weak in person. You have already described that my speech is contemptible. But let me be clear. When I came to you, I did not come with superiority of speech. I did not come with excellency of speech in man's wisdom. In other words, I did not come with the philosophical giants and the philosophical sophistry of the men that you reveal. I did not come with the human wisdom, but I came in demonstration of the spirit and the power. And I've determined not to know anything except Christ and him crucified. No, I am not as gifted oratorically as some of the philosophical giants of your of your constituency i i didn't come with this philosophical kind of loftiness no, that's not what i did and i already know that my speech is not like the rest of the of the teachers that you know but i came in demonstration of the spirit and power and i determined not to know anything Oh, it's not that I don't know anything. I determine not to know. Oh, Jesus, help me. It's not that I, I don't know. I determined not to know. Do not get it twisted. I don't want you to think that I, being somebody who is well-learned in the law and well-versed in Judaism, don't think I don't have knowledge. It's just that I determined not to know anything except Christ and him crucified. In other words, the preeminent of my message is not to show you my intellectual display. 
But my emphasis has been to know nothing except the validity and the power of Christ and him crucified. The very thing you think is foolish is actually the power of God. And so Paul said, I have determined to stay with the validity of Christ and him crucified, which is antithetical to your philosophical postures. But that means me, no, never mind. It doesn't matter that you don't think that my speech is awesome. It doesn't matter that you don't think that I have awesome oratorical ability. It does not matter that my speech is not in line with the philosophical standard of the day. I've determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. What I preach is not rooted in human wisdom. Paul starts off the chapter with that form of argumentation. Then when you get to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6, he says, but we speak wisdom in a mystery. Oh, God is good preaching, y'all. He, he, he says, I speak wisdom to those who are mature, and I speak it in a mystery. The word mysterion speaks to that which is unknown until made known. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery. We speak the wisdom of God in that which was unknown until made known. The word mystery is speaking about the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was hidden in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. We speak that wisdom in a mysterion, and it's the hidden wisdom which God predetermined before time even started. God predetermined before the ages to our glory. I want you to be clear that the wisdom I'm speaking of is God's hidden wisdom. It is not the simplicity of this philosophical sophistry. It is not this foolishness in regards to man's wisdom. I'm speaking a hidden wisdom. I'm speaking a divine wisdom. I'm speaking about a wisdom that was unknown until made known. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say in verse number eight, and none of the princes of this world knew it because if they knew it, they wouldn't have killed Jesus. But God had to make sure that the wisdom was hidden and revealed at the right time because had they known too early who was Jesus, they wouldn't have killed Jesus. But they needed to kill Jesus in order for the mystery to go into effect. For had they not killed Jesus, we would not have our salvation. So it had to be a hidden wisdom that was revealed in increments. It was a hidden wisdom that was unknown until made known because had they known who he was, they would not have killed the Prince of Glory. But I had not seen, <laughs> ear had not heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared. That's 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. I didn't see it, ear didn't hear it, neither did it enter into the heart of man the things which God has prepared. What does that mean? Human wisdom could not attain what God was doing. God had to reveal it for you to know it. You would have never known it had not God revealed it because your eye didn't see it. Your ear didn't hear it. It didn't even enter into your heart the things which God has prepared because whatever God has prepared must be revealed. Human wisdom cannot attain it, nor can he, human wisdom take, uh, take control of it. It's something that is unknown until God makes it known. It's the mysterion of God. It is. Paul says, so when you compare... <laughs> When you compare what I preach to what your philosophers are talking about, there's no comparison. The wisdom I speak comes from God. It is a hidden wisdom that is divine in its origin. So much so that human wisdom could not attain it. Human wisdom would not have known it had not God revealed it. So much so that 1 Corinthians 2 verse 11 says, but God revealed it. By his spirit. <laughs> I didn't see it. Ear didn't hear it. Neither did it enter into the heart of man the things which God has prepared. Then the very next verse says, but God revealed it by his spirit. I believe that's verse 10. So verse 9, we says man didn't, God, excuse me, it didn't, uh, man didn't see it. He didn't hear it. Neither did it enter into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love them. And then the next verse, but God revealed it to them through the spirit of God. So how is it that man comes into a knowledge of what God has as a mystery? For to us, God revealed them through the spirit. In other words, the spirit of God is the agent, the third person of the Godhead reveals God's wisdom. Y'all got that? It reveals God's wisdom because human reasoning could not attain it. 
You philosophers that have attained the intellectual ecstasy of these philosophical structures that you've embraced, they have nothing on the wisdom of God. God's wisdom couldn't be known unless God's Holy Spirit made it known. Paul said, God made it known by the Holy Spirit. Now this brings me into my text. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 12. Look at verse number 12. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual with spiritual now listen to the text verse 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world now i want you to understand when paul speaks about the spirit of the world the spirit of the cosmos he's speaking of the disposition or the thinking of the world we have not received the spirit thinking disposition of the world he said but we have received initially the apostles have received the spirit that comes from God now the Holy Spirit is used in contrast to the world spirit let me explain it so when Paul says we have not received the spirit of this world that's the thinking of this world but we receive the Holy Spirit the spirit that comes from God, that is the Holy Spirit brings a divine thinking that is antithetical to a world thinking. I need you to get this in your mind. A child of God must recognize that my disposition has to shift because now I am under the sovereignty and the influence of the Holy Spirit that has revealed through the apostles God's wisdom. Now you're going to have to ask, you, ask yourself some questions. Do I use, or let me rephrase that, is the wisdom of God the filter through which I receive information? That whatever I hear, whatever I, whatever I see, wh whoever speaks to me, I make sure or should make sure that it is filtered through the wisdom that comes from gospel. Paul's, and I wish I had time to show you this, everything Paul received as the gospel of Jesus Christ was the wisdom by which he lived. So everything Paul did, everything Paul spoke, all the ways Paul behaved was governed by the wisdom that he received through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That musturion, that he received, that the Holy Spirit revealed, Paul would say that is the wisdom of God. And he says, we did not receive the disposition thinking of the world. Listen, man, the world has a way of shaping your thought process. And you'd be surprised that there's some people, oh, I'm going to get to it, that'll never understand you when you decide to live in God's wisdom. There are some people who will think you strange because you've decided to embrace a divine wisdom that's completely different from world wisdom. I'll go further. You will find that there are some Christians that will think you strange because you have carnal Christians that have not yet embraced divine thinking. And you'll be surprised how you sound real different and perhaps you sound a bit um, overly spiritualized because you have decided to walk in a divine wisdom. You need to prepare to be misunderstood. Oh, I don't know who I'm talking to. And this might be why some Christians, we almost feel like it's safer not to walk in God's wisdom. Because the minute you decide to walk in God's wisdom, you're going to stick out. 
and you're going to find that you are going to become an anomaly within a circle in which now you have embraced the notion of looking quite different than what people are used to because you decided to walk in the wisdom of God. Young people, young man, young woman, if you make a decision to walk in God's wisdom, you're going to look real different. You're going to look real strange. And you're going to find that in a moment in time, people are going to begin to assess and begin to judge you because of your embrace of divine wisdom that is now impacting you to think differently. Paul said, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that comes from God. And to the degree that that Holy Spirit has revealed the wisdom, watch this, in which we compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Now, I know some translations say spiritual things with spiritual words. In the original language, it just says, uh, praise God, to compare spiritual with spiritual. In other words, that which is carnal cannot understand or assess that which is spiritual. Because when you are comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, it means spiritual things are the only things that can explain spiritual things. (laughs) Spiritual things are the only things that can explain spiritual things. In other words, you have to recognize, and this word compare comes from a Greek term which means to combine, and it it has even been used to mean to interpret. You can interpret spiritual things only by spiritual things. And worldly thinking will never be able to assess or understand or interpret something spiritual. That's a reality. Now, I need you to get that in your spirit. Carnal thinking will never be able to interpret or assess or judge that which is spiritual. You can only compare spiritual things with spiritual things. In other words, you will never have access into understanding the spiritual if you're still functioning in the sphere of the carnal. Now stay with me. I'm still trying to interpret this thing for you. What are you arguing, Paul? I'm arguing that there is a difference between human wisdom and God's wisdom. I am arguing that when I came to you, I came into the power, I came with the power of the Holy Spirit in demonstration of the spirit and the power. And I did not come to you with excellency of speech. I did not come to you with superiority of speech. I am not in the caliber of your philosophical giants. That's not me. You've already indicated that my speech is contemptible and you've already said my letters are weighty, but, but I didn't come to you trying to be on the level of a person who is an oratorical giant. I came in demonstration of the spirit and the power and I did determined to know nothing except Christ and am crucified. I stick with the validity of that divine message. And if you want to know where my wisdom comes from, it is a mysterion. It is that which was unknown till made known. It's God's hidden wisdom that has a divine source. And that wisdom was so powerful that had the princes of this world knew it, they would not have killed Jesus. But I didn't see it. Ear didn't hear it. Neither entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared. The Holy Spirit has made known that wisdom. But carnal people will never understand it. Carnal people can't access it. Carnal people can't uh, comprehend it. It is that which is revealed in which we compare spiritual things with spiritual. Now watch what Paul does with that. Watch what Paul does with that. Paul says, <laughs> look at verse 14. Contrast, but a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. Watch this. Because they are spiritually appraised. That word appraised comes from a Greek term, anakrenu, and it means spiritually discerned or judged. The natural man can't discern or spiritually judge that which is spiritual. The natural man is a sukikos man. He is natural in that he is saturated and governed by human wisdom. And because that is his thinking, which would describe many of the Corinthians and the Athenians, they were so philosophical that they could not accept a Christocentric message because it didn't fit their paradigm and thought process. Listen, as a Christian... 
May I suggest you must be prepared to be misunderstood. May, may I suggest that you must prepare for the moment in time when you are completely and absolutely different from the circle in which you exist. Let, let me help y'all with this. Um, let me finish the interpretation. The natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are foolish. They are spiritually appraised. They are anakinu. They are assessed or judged um, from a perspective of spirituality, which the carnal man doesn't have. Watch verse 15. But he who is spiritual, up, oh God, appraises, he can judge, he can anakinu all things, yet he himself is appraised by nobody. Let me explain that. God, Lee. The spiritual man mm, has the capacity <laughs> to assess and judge everything. Wait, wait, wait. I thought the Bible says do not judge. Um, yeah, when Jesus said that, he was talking about a hypocritical judgment. A judgment in which you come to condemnation while ignoring your own sin. To be hypocritical in your judgment. Uh uh. We're talking about that a child of God who is spiritual can assess all things because he looks at things through the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is the lenses through which he interprets what he interacts with. So when you put a situation in front of a child of God who's spiritual, that child of God will assess that thing through spiritual lenses. He uses the wisdom of God, the God, the gospel centered wisdom that has been revealed. He assesses things from a spiritual paradigm. God's divine wisdom is the paradigm or the glasses through which he looks at everything he interfaces with. You put a situation in front of a child of God, the child of God does not allow himself to sink into his naturalness. He assesses it spiritually. Mm. The spiritual man is not a perfect man. And I don't want you to hear the word spiritual to mean perfection. Spiritual man is a person who thinks from a spiritual perspective. He uses divine wisdom as the means by which he comes to a judgment. May I suggest that when it's time for you to get advice, be careful about surrounding yourself with carnal thinkers. Because carnal thinking can appease you from the perspective of what you want to hear. But it is the spiritual man that's got to tell you what you need to hear. Praise the mighty name. Anybody who, who knows me, <laughs> this is, and it takes somebody who knows me. If you ask me advice about a circumstance or situation, anybody who knows me knows that I don't believe you should ever Suspend God's wisdom because what you're doing is opposite of it. Let me explain it differently. Even if I do something that's opposite of the will of God, I don't think you should ever suspend the will of God because you are out of line with it. Even if I'm out of line with the will, my responsibility is still to tell the will. And every child of God needs to be a person that is spiritual enough to tell the truth even if you have imperfection. You can't suspend the will of God conveniently because you're trying to get God to sign off on what you want. If you bring a situation in front of me, I have to assess it oh, from the perspective of divine wisdom in an objective way because I don't want to interject my thinking or my ways into what God wants you to hear. So a spiritual person can assess all things when he's using God's wisdom as his paradigm. That's the power of that. Okay. But the natural man, mm -mm, he, he can't even understand what you're trying to do with that. He, the natural man says, um, 
yeah, I hear what the Bible says, but would you mind telling me what I want to hear right now? The natural man doesn't care anything about divine wisdom. He does not care about lining up with divine wisdom because, oh, Jesus, because what I will accept that comes out of your mouth has got to fit how I already think. Oh, Jesus. The natural man says, I want to hear what you got to say, but I reserve the right to reject it if it does not fit how I already think. That's that natural man. Natural man says, if I don't agree with it, I reserve the right to disagree with it and not accept it. Even if what you're saying is from a divine source, even if what you're saying is from God, I reserve the right to reject it because the natural man wants to hear what the natural man already agrees with according to how he already thinks. And you'd be surprised how many people um, get to us. And sometimes we do. Everybody. Everybody has that moment when you don't want to hear scripture. I wish I had two or three honest people right here that will be honest. Sometimes I don't actually want to hear you quote a text. Sometimes my natural man is so in the way that the last thing I want to hear is divine perspective. I really want you to line up with how I already think because a natural man reserves the right to reject what you say if what you say don't line up with what I already think. So if I'm not thinking that, if that's the way my thinking is, I reject it. If that's not what I want to hear, I reject it. I don't care what you say from God's vantage point. I reject it if it don't fit my philosophical structure. Oh, no, I ain't doing that. You want me to, you want me to forgive who? Today? When? Now? Do you know what said person did to me? Oh, no. It's, uh, yeah, listen. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but um, uh, yeah, now, now here's our famous statement when we don't like God's perspective. Uh, y'all ever said this? I ain't there yet. I wish I had two or three people there. Um, yeah, I hear that. I ain't there yet. That's our way of saying, in a very nice way, I reject that. I reject that. I, I ain't there yet. No, I, I, ain't, I ain't there yet. Yeah, well, you don't have to learn how to be patient with that person because I know you're upset, I know you're angry, but you're going to have to exercise some tolerance and you're going to have to be for, but I ain't there yet. No, I ain't there yet. Well, what I'm saying to you is um, this is the way you got to live your life because, you know, you, you need to live your life in this way because if you don't live your life this way, um, it's not going to be in line with God. I ain't there yet. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. No, I'm not neither. It's that moment, oh, Jesus, when you tell a young girl, you tell a young man, rather, in this culture, in this time, you tell a young man, you have a conversation with him, and you you tell that young man, you say, listen, buddy, um, I want you to know and get get some information here. You know, we live in a culture, young man, that expects you to be... um, promiscuous in your behavior and I know as a young man sometimes people think manhood is based on your engagement in said sexual activity I need you to know that it's all right to be a young man that saves himself before marriage yeah even even the folk here right now quiet on me I, I, I don't think I have any amens in the chat or here young man you need to know It's okay to live a disciplined life where you reserve yourself for the woman you're going to marry. And I know that this culture does, and I know it prompts you to to demean and look at women as that which is to be hunted or or, or be a predator on. I I need you to know, young man, that um, you can save yourself. And it it takes being more of a man to be disciplined and to engage in such activity. And I want you to know God's way is that you save yourself for that woman. And here go that young man to school. And then this young man start talking to him. Man, you saw Janet today? I heard she like you, boy. And you know what? They tell me, you know, that she, she, she'll do something. You know, and I think, I think for you, 
man, you need to talk to a man. You can, you, this might go down. This could happen for you. And here this young man got started talking, well, you know, I don't, I don't really, I don't, you know, I really don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to do that. But what you mean you don't want to do that, man? What's wrong with you? Janet is fine. You better go ahead. Like, listen, man, I, I heard she's already kind of been around. Like, I, think, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Go ahead, go, go talk to her, man. You know, she's been talking. Nah, you know what? I just, that ain't really what I want to do. You know, that ain't really what I want to do. What you mean? What's your problem, man? You know, I talk to my dad and talk to my, you know, I just want to save myself. To, for, you know, God's way is that you don't engage in this kind of activity. That's God's way. And then here come these young men talking about, dude, what planet you from? Well, what's wrong with you? You want to do what? Yeah, you go ahead and do that because we ain't there yet. <laughs> that, that ain't, that ain't, that, it, that's how you want to do that? I don't understand that. that. That don't even make good sense. You mean to tell me you going to wait? You going to wait? And you can have it now? Don't you think you need to get some practice in? Like, you know, listen, waiting ain't the thing because you need experience. Y'all going to help me along in here, boy. It's, it, you need experience because, I mean, shoot, we, we young. I mean, we got to figure all this out before we get to that place where we actually trying to uh, get married. I mean, before we get married, we need to experiment so I can see what it is I like and don't like. You know, that's, I mean, listen, man, look, everybody's, a, listen, man, look, look, that God stuff ain't realistic. Realistic is I ain't waiting. That's real. So if you want to know what's realistic, if you want to know what's real, what's real is what's happening right now in your human existence. We, I mean, look, that sound good, but that ain't realistic. Have you ever had somebody tell you God's way ain't realistic? Y'all, I, I, I'm not getting no help. God, God's way, listen, God's way don't really work. I know that sound good, but nah, man, nah, player, listen. That ain't how real life works. Real life don't work that way. Ain't nobody trying to wait on you to figure that out. When you decide to walk in God's wisdom, carnal folk can't make sense of your divine wisdom walk. I wish I had two or three. You know, I think what happens too when, when, when preachers start getting in this area or anybody for that matter, I think what we start thinking is, man, is, is how do you say that in the today culture? And I get it because if we tell the truth, 90, well, that's, this is a proverbial number, 95% of us already messed that boat up. So in our minds, we feel like if we couldn't do it, we shouldn't teach it. So if we failed at it, we ought not teach that because it weren't realistic for us. Therefore, it's not realistic for them. And so what we start doing is we start watering down the will of God to fit a culture. And here it is, a young, to tell a young man to save himself. You know why I chose the young man jargon? Because we always want to start with the young woman. And we always want to tell the young woman to save herself. We never tell the young man that is also important for him to save himself. God didn't make that kind of teaching gender specific. So to tell a young man that it takes a discipline that you can wait and that you, that's, that's, that's divine. When you decide to walk in that kind of wisdom and you teach your children that in a culture that's very different, in a culture that thinks differently, that is inviting your child to walk into a, to walk in a divine wisdom while folk will judge them in the carnal sphere and say, that don't make no sense. I have heard, uh, there, there were, there, there are some women who remained virgins till they got married and are castigated by women who didn't do that. As if the virgin was wrong for waiting. Y'all not going to help me along in here. And we flip the coin and castigate the one who did it right. And we give the impression that doing it right was actually wrong in stupidity. We tell the young man who may have waited, and we tell that young man who may have waited, well, listen, that, that, I don't, you know, I mean, kudos to you for waiting, but I don't know why you waited. We castigate the person who desires to walk in a divine wisdom. And so what we get is we get to this space 
where divine wisdom is treated like it's not reality. Y'all not helping me along. And that's all right, because I get why we can't help here. Uh, most of us have already failed in this boat, praise Jesus. And that's okay, including, including Dr. Haywood, praise God. We don't need to, uh, we, we, a lot of us failed in that. You know why? Because we was conditioned by culture. And so we, but we don't need to dumb down that. When it comes to how you do, praise God, when it comes to how you do a relationship, when it comes to how you do forgiveness, all of that is divine wisdom. Do you not know, and I, I say this even to, to, to folk who are married, even if you do marriage, do you not know marriage has to be walked within God's divine wisdom? It's, it's, it's because it is ordained and created by God, which means there is a wisdom to the marriage institution to which we are not allowed to walk in a carnal sphere. We have to walk in a divine sphere. That, that's just how that works. When it comes to patience, patience is walking in a divine wisdom. Now, you'll be surprised how when it comes to Christocentric behaviors, we often try to suspend divine wisdom. And we have to be willing to say, nah, that's, that's, that's not the way we're going to go with that. Um, no, no, I'm just not that person that wants to submit to the practice of continuous lying. And so I'm going to walk in the divine wisdom. No, I, I'm not that person who is going to engage in substance abuse. I'm going to walk in the divine wisdom. No, we can go have a good time, but I don't have to get intoxicated to have a good time with you. You decide to walk in the divine wisdom. That's okay. You can't say sorry when you decide to walk in a divine wisdom. You can't feel bad about me being different as a child of God. You can't let people put you in a box and make you feel like, man, something wrong with me because I decided to do it right. You can't make people, you can't allow people to make you feel as if you're some kind of alien from a different planet all because you decided to embrace a divine wisdom. At some point, you've got to say, it's all right for me to walk in a divine wisdom. Now watch this as I close this. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, watch this, at the end of the chapter. Oh, I love this verse. I love this verse. He says, verse 15, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Listen, what that means is carnal people can't judge spiritual people. They do not have the capacity to judge spirituality when they exist in carnal thinking. So a carnal person who interprets what they do according to the culture cannot judge me on a cultural standard when I'm walking in a divine wisdom. Can't do it. Carnal people cannot judge spiritual people. Watch this. Verse 16. This is why. For or because who has known the mind of the Lord? Now he's quoting Isaiah 40 verse 13. Who has known the mind? The, the Hebrew says who has known the spirit of the Lord? The Septuagint says who has known the mind of the Lord? And who has instructed him? Let me help you out with that. Paul says you want to know why carnal people can't assess you? You want to know why carnal people cannot and I can know they cannot judge or discern the will of God. You want to know why they are not allowed to appraise you? It's because if you're walking in the mind of the Lord, then how can somebody carnal judge God's mind? If I'm walking in the mind of God, then a carnal mind does not have the capacity to judge somebody walking in God's mind. And then Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> we have the mind of Christ is but to say we have the mind of God, which puts me out of reach for a carnal person to judge me for my spiritual walk. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, God help me. And so when we start talking about the wisdom of God, it must not only be what saved me. It must be the paradigm for which I think. Well, all right, you, you, you know, you seem to be saying carnal people in the world can't understand the will of God. But whoa, 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 there's carnal people in the church. Understand what I mean by carnal. Carnal doesn't, oh, spiritual does not mean perfect. Spiritual means those who walk in harmony with the spirits leading the will of God. Doesn't mean perfection. Carnal is a person who thinks from a worldly human perspective. 
Now watch chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Your Bible, uh, we, we don't have chapters and verses. So watch what he does in chapter 3, verse 1. And our brothers, <laughs> now we're speaking to Christians, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Now he's talking to Christians. He says, I could not speak to you as spiritual men. I had to speak to you as men of flesh or men that are natural. As to infants, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like men? Man, if you caught up in jealousy and envy and bitter fighting and strife and selfish ambition, Paul said, that's fleshly. Paul says, I need you to come up and walk into divine wisdom where you go from natural to spiritual, where you embrace the mind of God and suspend your naturalism. And don't allow yourself to be castigated by carnal people who try to assassinate your character because you decide to do it God's way. You can't be sorry for doing it God's way. Oh, Jesus, you can't be sorry for doing it God's way. You can't be sorry because you for, you've decided to forgive somebody who wronged you. You can't be sorry because you decided to be tolerant with somebody that's difficult to deal with. Folk will say, don't put up with that. Don't put up with that. Don't put up with that. You ain't got time for that. Man, some people you need to kick out of your life. God says you better learn how to do tolerance and forgiveness and forbearance because that's walking in my wisdom. Don't walk like men. Don't walk fleshly. And you can't be sorry for that. Young lady, don't be sorry because you decided to do it right. Young man, don't be sorry because you decided to do it right. Don't, don't allow yourself uh, to be pulled into the pressure of a person assassinating you because you decide to walk in God's wisdom. Because this world has a way of influencing how you think. Now, I don't know as I close, I don't know what you're going through, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself a question. Have I judged my situation from the perspective of divine wisdom? Question one. Do, do, I, do I look at it from the perspective of divine wisdom? How I deal with this person, am I dealing with them from the perspective of divine wisdom? My situation I'm in, my crisis, my thing I'm going through, how are you assessing that? Do are you trying to walk spiritually with carnal advice or do you filter what you hear through divine perspective? Man, that's some powerful stuff. And all of us have to challenge ourselves and ask these hard questions. How much space does God wisdom take up in my mind? And how much space does human wisdom take up in my mind? And that's the challenge of being a child of God. Now, I could say so much more about that. I, I could take this down to how the culture dresses us. I could take this down to how women are sexualized and men for that matter. I can show you that this culture has conditioned us to accept certain things that God would never accept. I could show you how this culture right now is trying to get us to be acceptance, uh, accepting of same sex relationship. I could show you how we're being sensitized to these these things that are absolutely antithetical to God. And, and that's what the culture is doing. That's what the culture is doing. I can show you how churches are being pressured now to accept and to do and to perform same-sex marriages. I could show you how in every fabric of our existence, there are areas where we are being challenged to give up divine wisdom. And we fall right into it. And we accept it. And we embrace it. What we have to learn to do is recognize the struggle, but we have to push to walk into the sphere of divine wisdom. And I think God will absolutely be pleased. If you are here this morning 
And you're at the place where you're saying, I'm ready to break out. I'm ready to break out of the sphere of carnality. And I'm ready to enter into the sphere of divine wisdom. I'm ready to be a spiritual man, not a natural man. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. If you want to be baptized for the remission of your sins, I want you to call the phone number that's on your screen right now and say, I'm ready to be baptized into Christ and come into the kingdom. And I want to walk as a spiritual man, a disciplined man, a disciplined woman. A woman that's not sorry to say that I walk in divine wisdom. A man that's willing to say I walk in divine wisdom. A man and woman who's willing to say our marriage is in the sphere of divine wisdom. A person that's willing to say my friendships are in the sphere of divine wisdom. My patience and my forbearance and my forgiveness are an outgrowth of my divine wisdom. I want to walk not in my naturalism. I want to walk in divinity. Why don't you come right now? Say yes to Jesus, and I invite you to come walk in the wisdom of God. Move from natural to spiritual. Why don't you come right now? Praise the mighty name of Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind. Transform it. Take my Well, let's say amen for that amazing word. We just thank God so much for Brother Orpheus J. Hayward and the power of the word and another powerful message just for you from the Lord. As we keep you engaged, we just want to take just a moment to go through some of our announcements. So if you pay attention to the screen, I will walk through these with you as quickly as possible. And then we look forward to all of you joining us for our Bible school. Oh, it's time again for the Bible shop. Brothers, if you missed the March 6th Bible shop, you missed a spiritual gospel treat. So join us this Saturday. What is that date? April the 3rd. April the 3rd, 6 o'clock. Of course, it says March the 6th, but it's every first Saturday. So we look forward to you joining us the first Saturday in April. Go ahead and screenshot this particular picture so you will know exactly where to go. And we look forward to you joining us for another great experience. Speaking of joining us, if anybody is interested in joining the audiovisual team, you have no idea how much it takes to pull off what is being pulled off. And we have an amazing team, but they are looking for more players on the team to begin ASAP with training. So please contact Wesley or Radia Allen at the Gmail that you see. And uh, if you contact one, you've contacted them both. Married couple. Don't you love it? Awesome to have couples engaged in ministry. Oh, and that's all that we have. Okay. I didn't realize that was it. So that is it. Uh, we look forward to the next quarter. It is about that time, isn't it? Is it time for the spring quarter? Let's see. Sunday. The, the, oh, okay. This Sunday, today, and Next, this Wednesday coming up is going to be the last time for the spring quarter. So just a winter quarter. So spring quarter begins after this Wednesday coming up. So we look forward to all of you being a part of our next quarter. But let's finish out strong today and Wednesday in our winter quarter classes. And they will begin 10 minutes after Brother, Brother Robert Wilson says amen. He'll come forward now for our closing prayer. Thank you. God bless you. We love you. And ladies, don't forget about prayer warriors. We didn't have the slide up, but I know the prayer warriors are looking for you tomorrow evening uh, for their Monday prayer. Thank you. Once again, we want to thank Orpheus for a, a great message, as he always does. And we just thank him for his due diligence that he 
Sunday in, Sunday out gives us powerful messages that we can feed on, nourish our spiritual bodies to grow thereby. Let us pray. Kind, merciful Father in heaven, we're so thankful again that we've had this opportunity. We thank you for the word that has been preached. We thank you for your man, servant, Dr. Orpheus J. Hayward. Continue to bless him in a special way, he and his family. As well as the leadership of this church, we continue to pray for the members of this church, those who have experienced sickness uh, and those who experience loss of loved ones. We want to be pray for them and pray, Father, that you might just be with them and nourish them and bring those that are sick back to wellness, if it be your will. Pray, Father, that you go with us as we go out into this world. We know there are a lot of things that are transpiring, but we know that you are always there because you have said in your word that you would never leave us nor forsake us, and we thank you so much for that. For we ask all these prayers in the mighty name of Jesus, the one who died, that we might live. Amen. Lord, we've turned our backs on you far too many times. The cost of sin is too much to bear, but still you pay the fine. So I just don't want to be another person in the crowd. Hear my prayer, Lord, hear my battle cry. And I'm so thankful for this intercession with you. I feel like I've entered into heaven when I'm in your presence. When I'm in your presence. And Lord, please bless this body of your saints with your family. I pray for love and abundant peace for all my enemies And I know that Satan's in there somewhere sitting in the crowd So hear my prayer, Lord, hear my battle cry And I'm so thankful for this intercession with you I feel like I've entered into 